Team Women and Empower Leadership Academy is honored and privileged to partner with Global Minnesota and bring our two communities together. Like Global Minnesota, we focus on developing leaders from the classroom to the boardroom by providing opportunities for education, networking, mentoring, and personal and professional development. I'm a huge fan of storytelling and learning how others landed in the boardroom, leveraged their networks, and triumphed over their failures. It's so helpful to envision your own path when others share their experience, strength, and hope. In fact, our mission at Team Women is we inspire women to rise together. One of the reasons we were founded was to help get more women in the boardroom. So when I heard that uh, Global Minnesota had invited Susan to speak, I leapt at the chance to participate. I heard Susan interviewed when she told the story of why she wrote the book. She was at a gala where all of the award winners were women and she was amazed and inspired by their stories. That's when she knew she needed to help share their stories of women leaders. And I thought to myself, Susan, you would love Team Women. Our community is filled with Twin Cities top leaders and we have events where we get to lift up other women that inspire me every day. So thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to participate in this event, Mark. Now, I'm privileged to introduce our speaker for the night. Susan Sloan is the author of A Seat at the Table, Women Diplomacy and Lessons for the World. She works for a global nonprofit advocacy organization in Washington, DC, engaging with diplomats, government officials, community organizers, and international leaders. She has met with more than 60 countries through diplomacy, ad advocacy, and experiential education. At the age of just 30, she completed a life goal of visiting all seven continents. Susan holds a master's degree in global strategic communications from Georgetown University and graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in journalism with a major in public relations and a minor in Spanish from the University in Georgia, of Georgia. Please help me welcome Susan Sloan. Katie, thank you for having me today and Team Global Minnesota and all the partners. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually. I know we had planned to be with each other in person and hopefully that, that will happen uh, maybe in a few months or maybe in a year to come. But for now, it's my pleasure to be with you all this evening. I want to tell you a little bit about my book, uh, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World. I started the process of writing it uh, back in April of 2019. And like Katie said, I, I was at a gala and all women leaders happened to be honored. And it was the first time I had been at an event where only women had been honored, uh, especially at a diplomatic function. And I thought, who, who's sharing these stories? Is this only going to happen in a vacuum? So that's what was the impetus of the book. And when I started the interviewing process and reaching out to different women leaders and also having many male allies help me along the way to introduce me to their colleagues and their friends, it became this treasure trove of information, secrets, data, and research that became the book. I interviewed more than 30 ambassadors, foreign ministers, and government officials spanning all the regions of the world. And so it really became a, an international exploration. All the women I interviewed had varying styles of leadership. Uh, however, one thing they all had in common is that many of these women were the first in their roles, whether they were the first chief of staff, the first woman ambassador, the first woman foreign minister, all of them have been the first woman sitting at the table in their position. And so tonight I'm going to share with you three distinct stories from my book. And more than that, I hope that each of you, as you learn these stories, uh, hopefully want to get a book, but more importantly, realize how much gender parity, equality, and equity affect all of us and create better solutions for the world. I'm going to tell you why this is important and why we're speaking about this. There's a statistic that I love to share that the participation of civil society groups, including women's groups, makes a peace agreement 64% less likely to fail. 64%, that's a pretty good percentage. 
And a few months ago, foreign policy research showed a statistic that I find quite fascinating in the for-profit sector, that companies with the highest percentage of women in management are 47% more profitable than the lowest. So gender equality and having women in management and leadership benefits all of us positively. So we need women at the table. The three topics I am going to share with you tonight are about resilience, inclusivity, and emotional intelligence. The first story I'm going to share with you uh, comes from Namibia, so in Africa. I sat down with the ambassador, Monica Nishandi, uh, over chamomile tea, and I write about this in the book, and I describe the embassy, and she told me her story in a very candid manner. And we sat together for about an hour and a half or so, uh, and she shared things that she has really never shared publicly before. And so she was living in Namibia that was formerly controlled uh, by South Africa under apartheid. And she was with her family and she was harassed at her school. She was one of the, uh, the few schools that spoke English and learned English. Uh, and she found that with daily harassment and her family being unsafe, that her and her friends decided they needed to leave uh, and fight for the independence of their country and their people. They saw friend, friends and family members uh, being beaten in the streets, teachers harassed. She even witnessed someone being dragged uh, connected to a tailpipe of a car until they died. Uh, and so with this violence, she figured she better leave. She didn't tell her family and she escaped in the evening and she went over the border to Angola and she was in exile. Uh, and she describes that women in her society were doubly exploited. The fact that it was traditionally supposed to be that women were supposed to be in the kitchen, and that that was exploitation. And then they, the system itself favored men. So it was this double exploitation of women. While she was in exile and living in a refugee camp, SWAPO was created, the Southwest Africa People's Organization. She started fighting for her country's independence and learning. And while she was in the bush, she got married. In her own words, she said that to me. And in the refugee camp, after fighting on the front lines for independence, she actually gave birth to her first child. And Swapo asked her if she would be willing to leave her child in the refugee camp with friends and family to go travel around the world to fight for her country's independence in a diplomatic way. And so that's exactly what she did. She went around the world on behalf of future Namibia to fight for her country's independence. And she came up with a lot of adversity along the way as different especially men leaders, discounted her at first. And her resilience really led her to the table on behalf of her country. Some men would even attempt to stop her speaking, even at UN assemblies. And she was also young and she was a woman. So she had two, two points against her, basically. She discovered that she was the best person to speak on behalf of her country and that age and gender had nothing to do with it at all. There's this quote I wanna share with you that she mentioned to me in our conversation, that women have to participate in the diplomatic field. Women are good at negotiating and can achieve results. You may not always convince a group of people, but when you leave them with homework to consider your position, it's been well done. And that's what she started doing, is negotiating on behalf of her country. And eventually, Namibia gained independence in 1990. And the government actually, one of the first initiatives they did was they formed a gender equality policy. And she was pivotal in helping make that happen. Through her career, she's had numerous positions. She's been the deputy chief of protocol. She's also been the undersecretary for political and economic affairs. And she was Namibia's first ambassador to several Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland. And she even had the most two prestigious postings in her diplomatic career in the UK and in the US. Her idea though that she mentioned to me is that she didn't wanna fill a quota as a woman. She didn't want to be a token woman at the table. She called it not decorating a list. And so she wanted, and her and her colleagues who were women, wanted to be based there in these positions on merit, not on quotas. 
And that's something I heard from many women leaders that merit and qualifications are 100% important and imperative in filling positions in the diplomatic corps. While she was in the UK, uh, she had a, an interesting time. Her husband was in the military and was back in Namibia. She was raising two children. A family member came to live with her, and she also decided to pursue a master's degree at the same time. And so what she did to follow diplomatic protocol and also uh, not create any era of uh, corruption, she decided to not take her official car and her driver to go to her classes in the evening. So she'd work her day job of, of being uh, the high commissioner to the UK, the ambassador. And then she would take the train to her classes, which made the commute far longer. And then would take the train home and her children would already be asleep. But she accomplished getting her master's degree and her family helped her raise her children. Uh, and this was actually very impressive, not only to her colleagues, but to herself, she was very proud that she was able to accomplish this. And under her government, uh, Swapo started looking at gender equality in a different manner than other countries in the African continent. They discovered that they wanted to institute what they called a zebra policy, which called for about 50% of leader position, leadership positions to be filled by women. And the data actually backs up this approach. Um, after Im implementing this policy, they saw a massive increase of women in, in parliament. Uh, in 2009, about 26.9% uh, of these seats were filled by women. And in 2014, that moved to 41.3%. So it, the trajectory of that really helped to increase gender equality and parity at the table. Uh, and even the US ambassador to Mim Namibia, at least Johnson, publicly stated in 2019, during the International Women's Day, that America needs to follow Namibia's lead and increase women in political representation. So many people are agreeing with Namibia and what they've been doing. Uh, and under Nishandi's leadership, she also served as ambassador to Ethiopia and she was the permanent representative to the African Union, the governing body for the continent. She really took an active role in helping to develop the continent and she helped discover trade negotiations for the African continental free trade area. And numerous countries participated, almost all of them, and it's the largest free trade area in the world, actually. I was happy to discover this when we had our conversation, but more than that, when I researched her role and what she did, um, she was very humble in the way she described it. And uh, that, that's her personality is humility as well. Um, but this trade agreement was so important, and it continues to be important for the African continent in, in many different ways. Uh, it actually required participating countries to remove tariffs from 90% of the goods, and it opened up the continent to services and goods, and this agreement has boosted the intra-Africa trade by 52%. Uh, and so it keeps on increasing trade in the continent, and it's a good thing for Africa. One thing, though, that uh, the ambassador mentioned to me the, in our conversation and something she witnessed herself firsthand, especially fighting for the War of Independence, uh, is that in war, she asked me, who suffers the most? And she told me that it's women and children. And it's one of the many reasons why we need women at the negotiating table and the diplomatic table and the resolution table. Women and children seem to suffer the most in war and conflict and are greatly affected. If we don't have women there to understand these problems and help build solutions, then we'll keep being in the same position. Another thing she told me is that serving her country hasn't been a right, it's really been a privilege. And I could see that in her eyes as, as she spoke to me. Uh, in 2020, uh, this year, it marks Namibia's 30th anniversary of independence. And really through Ambassador Nishandi's resilience, uh, it's amazing to see how far, how far they've come. So that's the first story I'm sharing with you tonight. The second story is about inclusiveness and inclusivity. And it comes from Europe, it comes from Albania. Uh, I met Ambassador Floretta Farber at multiple events actually with, uh, in Washington, D.C. And she has always been a gracious diplomat representing her country and also a diplomat who has openness 
uh, and, and really a, a mindfulness to all countries. And she has great relations with many countries in Washington, D.C., but more than that, she's really brought Albania up to the mark in the diplomatic sphere. Uh, when she started her career, she wasn't a diplomat. She, in fact, worked in the private sector and she came from a country that was under, as she described it, socialism, communism, and really had to build, help build her country in multiple ways. She was the youngest of three daughters and the history of her country, uh, while she said, had, had a stormy past uh, and decisions in the government sometimes were completely wrong. The one thing that she felt that her government had done right, especially before they really gained independence, was that both men and women played a positive role in society, that they were granted the same rights, especially the pay was generally equal. Uh, however, the decision making usually was still male dominated. But in 1991, um, much of that changed, especially from the fall of communism. And she ended up joining the Chamber of Commerce and then and also working for Deloitte in a different capacity. That's where she learned how to negotiate between government, business, international leaders, and community leaders. And those negotiation skills of inclusivity helped her build her professional experience. And in 2015, she was appointed the ambassador to the United States. She is uh, a force to be reckoned with, I will say, and the first woman ambassador to lead her country in Washington, DC. And what she did, the first thing she did was to reach out to the majority of ambassadors who have been posted in Washington to listen to them and ask questions. And that's something I heard from many of the women leaders I interviewed for this book, is that the art of listening is something a leader must do. It's something that is pivotal to a leader's success. And it doesn't matter if you're in the diplomacy field or not, all leaders need to listen. So she went on this listening tour and then when she was posted in Washington, she was there for about three days and it was a Saturday. She went into the embassy to look at her office and organize things and she was on the third floor level and she heard a knock below at the embassy door. And she thought, well, it's Saturday, why is anyone knocking at the embassy door? And she, she went down to answer it. And there were people outside and they asked if the embassy was open. And she said, no, it's Saturday, the embassy's not open. And so then she went and closed the door and went back up to her office. A few minutes later, another knock on the door happens. The same questions happen. And this happened over and over again. And she called her embassy staff and said, why are people knocking on the doors? Like, what's going on on a Saturday? And they told her, oh, um, you know, Washington, D.C. has these open house embassy days where you can visit different embassies and see them and visit with their staff and see what their country is about. But we, we never really open our doors. And so that's the first thing she said to her team was, from now on, Albania's doors will be open. And that's exactly what they did. Year after year under her leadership, they have opened their doors not only to these embassy days that happen in the springtime in Washington, D.C., but also to be inclusive to the diplomatic culture in Washington and broader than that, the American community. And it's something she really took to heart. The embassy actually, a funny story enough, it was redecorated and redone. And she played a pivotal role in doing that. The building is historic. I was sitting there with her myself. It's magnificent. Uh, it's right in DuPont, DuPont Circle, and uh, about maybe a 15 minute walk from the White House and it had been renovated inside however it hadn't been decorated and her small team gathered together and said hey we have a limited budget what can we do and she helped with her team to redecorate the embassy to make it a place of convening of inclusivity and also welcoming guests on behalf of her country as most of the women i interviewed uh speaking about diplomacy they said you know they entertain on behalf of their country they eat and drink on behalf of their country and it's important to have a place to do that. And that's something that she did and she describes it to me and I wrote about it in the book. But one thing I found really important about the way she went about it is that she didn't say, no, we can't do this and we don't have a big enough budget. And many organizations and many leaders will find that, especially working in different fields, you don't always have the budget, you don't always have the opportunity, 
what can you create to make an opportunity? And that's the kind of leader, leader that she is. Another thing I learned from her is this idea that in order to represent her country, she cannot remain silent. And when she's at the table, whether she's the only woman or not, or the only person usually representing Albania, if she doesn't speak, Albania doesn't speak. And it takes shedding one's ego to stand up and speak and not be afraid of hearing no and trying to get the meeting at the administration or at Capitol Hill or at the State Department and not listening to the no, but keep going for the yes. She told me something that I, I, I've been carrying with me since our conversation, that inclusion is not solely about including others. It's also about including yourself. And I found that many of the women I spoke with had this mentality of inclusion of self. And when we speak about inclusivity, of including others and having diversity and gender equality, we also need to think on the, on the individual level. Are we saying yes to ourselves? And are we including ourselves in the conversation? Are we raising our hand? Are we taking that seat? And that's something that um, the ambassador from Albania does. Uh, and I'll, I'll bring it back to maybe like a, a current example. Uh, right now, when you say yes to yourself, it can mean many different things. We are in a global pandemic. That's why I'm not currently in the flesh in Minnesota. And we are facing unprecedented times. And there's many women leaders who are sitting around the table from different countries who were saying that their countries are faring far better than other countries. New Zealand, Germany, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Taiwan, they're all doing better with the coronavirus cases and the death rates. And also they're able to open up sooner. This idea of inclusivity, listening to health officials, having plans and coming together is an idea that women leaders are using and we're seeing the data and come out live in front of us what women can bring to the table, but more so the traits that women hold that all people can have of inclusivity. Another uh, area I want to share with you about this story is this idea of building an inclusive team. And that's something uh, the Albanian ambassador really put to heart. She has a small team at the embassy and she gathers them together and I don't know if she's doing this while the coronavirus is happening. I hope everyone's social distancing. But when coronavirus isn't happening, they all gather together around the table because she believes that feeling a part of something together also creates feeling a part of the success. It's not just the leader's success. It's everyone's success together. She instituted an evaluation process for her team so they could also see how they were doing. And everyone took part in it and she continues to do this every year so they understand what success is measured by, how it's measured, and how to get there. And so her level of inclusivity has really been pivotal for her country, for her embassy, and especially her work in the United States. The last story I'm gonna share with you is about emotional intelligence. And this story comes from Mexico. Uh, I sat down uh, with the Mexican ambassador, Martha Barcena, uh, in the Mexican embassy in Washington, DC. And it was actually quite challenging to get this meeting. She is a very busy woman. Uh, and as you know, since we are neighbors to Mexico, uh, her time in Washington has been even busier than uh, I would say previous ambassadors. Uh, and she, uh, she has this idea about diplomacy uh, that I found quite fascinating, that it's really essential to open hearts and open minds. And that's what diplomacy is essentially about. She happened to be the first woman ambassador to the US, which is quite impressive. Uh, she joined the Foreign Service in 1979. So she has been a career diplomat and she continues to uh, rise in the ranks of leadership. Uh, I'm sure she will continue to serve her country for many years to come. I hope she will because she's amazing. Uh, she's been the ambassador to Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, 
Turkmenistan, and she also, also has been the permanent representative of Mexico to the UN and Rome. She's done all this while having a family. Her husband has also been in the Foreign Service and they've been posted in, in separate countries and separate places. And she's done all this with grace and dignity and also mindfulness. She has a master's degree uh, in international studies from the diplomatic school in Spain. And she even has another master's degree in political philosophy from the Universidad Iberoamerica. And I found her, her education quite impressive. Uh, I, I still, uh, when I read her bio, I think I've been busy. No, she, she's the one who's really been busy. Um, she also, she told me she speaks Spanish and English, French and Italian, and she has a working knowledge of German, Danish, and Chinese. So I want you to think how amazing this leader is because uh, I, I was astounded by her and everything that she's been able to do. She's even on a policy level, she's crafted um, a convention of human rights for migrant workers. She negotiated tariff and trade situations. Uh, she's also aided in labor reform for Mexico. So her, her work is quite important for her country. In the beginning of her career, though, she served in the counselor section uh, in San Diego. Uh, she was helping uh, migrants and uh, immigrants that were being detained. And she came across a young woman uh, who was not speaking to any of the men workers or her men colleagues, but she pulled her aside and asked to speak to her simply because she was a woman. And she had told her that she had been sexually harassed uh, by one of the male guards in the detention area. And it happened to be a, a really difficult time and a difficult story that she heard. And she helped work on that case. But what she realized in that capacity is that women are so pivotal, pivotal in these situations and in these areas, especially for conflict. Uh, in the, and especially in war-torn nations, uh, if you don't have women in these areas able to speak to other women, refugees and immigrants and migrants, they're not gonna be able to speak out. And most women who feel vulnerable want to speak to another woman to actually share intimate details that they may not be comfortable sharing with the men. One thing I noticed in my research with the UN is that having women security officials, especially in conflict areas, is 100% helpful because women are able to go into women's homes, especially in conservative nations, and speak to the women, and they're able to find out if children are able to go to school or not. This lets them know of the security situation in a country. In addition to that, oftentimes women will be able to tell you stories, if you are a woman, about the political unrest and the social, social situations in their communities that give you a broader lens of what's going on. And so having women in these roles to speak to other women is important and imperative, especially for the safety and security of families. So back to the ambassador from Mexico, uh, she also saw this um, in many of the different UN agencies that she's been able to help with. But what she did say to me is that we need both men and women at the table. We have to have both genders together. It's important, we see things differently, we look at things differently. And she said, having both genders together really creates the dynamic of the negotiating table and of the solution table. It can't just be one gender. So we can't just have all women at the table either. She also discovered, and she, through her work, that women seem to seek out the intersection of interests instead of being obsessed with solely promoting issue positions. And this idea of using emotional intelligence to seek out this intersection of interest has been crucial for how she's been able to negotiate on behalf of her country. If you can think back to your own career and your own life, when you build a relationship, oftentimes you're not discussing the policy or the issue at hand, but you're actually getting to know the person and build a relationship, understand their interests and understanding why they're at the table and what motivates them. And so that's something that she's used as well. And it's been crucial to the success in her diplomatic career. 
one of the things that she did mention to me that I think many of us can understand being a diplomat, that the most moving moments in her career, they haven't had to deal with the tariffs that, and trade and negotiations she's been in or the policy positions, but rather the personal experiences of other people. Whenever she lands in a country and is posted somewhere different, she takes it upon herself to look at the art and literature and music of the nation. She reads, she's a voracious reader actually, and she reads poetry and fiction and nonfiction, but she wants to get the essence of the country to understand it. And that's the, the point of her diplomacy of having emotional intelligence is to really understand the country that you're in. And you have to be a part of the culture and the people and reading is, is a part of that. And that's something that's held her in good stead throughout her career. Uh, this emotional intelligence is based on reading, is what she told me. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, Mexico's come very far in, in gender equality, but they're still working on it. And she noted that herself. Um, last June, so June 2019, uh, she was helping negotiate tariffs and migration. And she was one of two women to be photographed at the negotiation table. In September 2019, she was the only woman to be photographed at the negotiation table on both sides. So we're, we're talking about Mexico in addition to America. So that's something to think about. If our countries around the world want to have diplomacy and have different ways to build solutions, we need to have both men and women at the table, not only one woman. And it, it's something that she, she mentioned to me that uh, she feels needs to change as soon as possible and that our world will be a better place for it. The last thing I'll share with you about Ambassador Barsena uh, is this quote that she shared with me, that public diplomacy doesn't contribute to, to anything unless we get rid of polarization that we're seeing in societies. Diplomacy can contribute to the smoothing of polarizations inside countries and between countries. And right now she, she said to me candidly that we're in a polarizing time uh, in many nations, and with the, especially with the rise of, of nationalism in different countries, but the polarization does not help diplomacy and multilateralism. And many countries are facing this and looking at it, and it's an important time and we have a choice to make in the diplomatic field and as well as global diplomacy. If we want to move away from polarization and really move to a place of emotional intelligence and inclusivity and also resilience. So those are the three stories I'm sharing with you tonight and I'm sure we'll get to more in the questions and answer. Uh, but I highly recommend getting the book so you can read the stories in full uh, and also understand the lives of these women and the challenges they've faced, and more than that, the lessons that they're sharing with the world. Thank you so much, Susan, Susan Sloan, and it, bringing back our memories of Ambassador Barsena, who was our Great Decisions conference speaker last year. What a brilliant, brilliant human being and, and international diplomat. But those stories that you share gave us a sense, and I can see from the questions that are already popping up that you are inspiring some young and you're getting some tough questions about the more complicated parts of life. And also you have people that have uh, really been thinking about uh, why we must have a new way of approaching how women are part of the whole process, young and old, that everybody now has a stake, so everybody should have a voice. I wanna bring in our moderator for the evening, Monica Cruz, who's the head of community affairs at our local consulate of Mexico. Uh, she's been there since 2013. Uh, we're a region where the Mexican community has been here since the late 1800s, a very large community. And she has responsibilities in the Dakotas, Wisconsin, Minnesota, helping the diaspora and people that are here uh, find the resources they need to increase their education, to close the, the gaps we have and disparities. But she didn't start out just in uh, diplomacy. She was uh, with the school in the UK. She worked in London for a, 
a startup and a company that became a multi-billion multi -million dollar uh, consultancy. Uh, she's been uh, traveling and working on projects around the world. And we're the lucky ones that the Mexican government uh, chose for her to come and be part of our community here. She's been very honored and we're uh, very appreciative of that consulate in general, uh, but also for her special leadership. So Monica, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm turning the baton over to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your very kind words and introduction. And Susan, thank you for your fantastic presentation. Um, your book is full of compelling stories. I wish I had a resource like that when I was doing my undergrad. It is so incredibly inspiring and it presents a wide range of women, uh, which is just fantastic. Um, you know, the questions are coming in, so thank you Global Minnesota members. Uh, you can ask questions through the chat function at the bottom of your screen, so I encourage you to do that. Um, so Susan, let's jump right in. Um, you know, some of the diplomats that you interviewed talk about, you know, men being more focused on winning as opposed to getting things done and women being, you know, less obsessed about who gets credit. Did you perceive a conflict in any of the women that you interviewed about having to compromise to get things done as an expectation from their male counterparts that wouldn't necessarily expect them to hold their positions or perhaps label them as difficult? There were a few women that mentioned that actually, uh, that in, especially early in their careers, they were perceived differently uh, due to the fact that they were women and their gender and that their male counterparts didn't necessarily face um, the same adversity. And right now we're seeing a shift though in countries, especially the Nordic and Scandinavian countries who have reached, a, I would say, a, a far bar of gender equality and gender parity that they're facing this less. But uh, uh, one story that comes to me from the ambassador of Finland, uh, and here she's reached the pinnacle of her career. She's ambas posted ambassador to, the, to Washington, D.C., to the United States, one of the highest postings. Uh, and yet she still faces adversity being a woman. And this idea of, with her ambassadorial colleagues, who maybe aren't women, of being questioned. Uh, she describes herself as having a weak voice, and if you Google and listen to her, her video transcripts, um, you can hear that her voice is a little bit um, softer than other individuals. And she's an amazing diplomat, and she's faced that adversity of having this, um, almost this unique voice, being um, a petite woman, uh, and just being a woman. And the fact that male colleagues have discounted her in some sense. But in addition to that, um, on the flip side, uh, there have been many women who have mentioned to me, and I write about this in the book, of having um, men, colleagues, who have uplifted them and been their mentors and, and helped fight adversity with them and for them. Uh, and so there's also a few stories of that. So we have seen both. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I have a question here that speaks to the stories that you just told us. In the, in the interviews you've had with women in diplomacy, do you find that women are more driven to find a solution to an issue because they understand the situational impact on the people, not the population at large? Good question. I could do a short answer and say yes, but I won't do the short answer. Uh, what, I, what I heard from these women leaders uh, is that I'm thinking of the best way to describe this. Women, uh, essentially, and the women leaders that I interviewed tend to have, uh, I would say, less ego. So it's not about them, it is about the solution. And there was this overwhelming idea that if the team wins, then they win. And seeing their team succeed, uh, is really pivotal. And the ambassador from Denmark mentioned to me about this, and I write about this in the book, that if her team does well, then she does well. If her team does well, then the country does well. And so it goes hand in hand. Uh, what we we're seeing in leadership right now, actually, uh, around the globe is that when ego takes over, especially looking at the coronavirus, and when it's all about an individual, uh, we oftentimes don't come to a solution. 
And if we can't understand when we're wrong, especially as a leader, uh, it won't help a solution either. And I'll give one key example. Look at the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Now here she helped eradicate essentially coronavirus. And in the last few weeks, there were a few visitors from, from different countries come in who have brought coronavirus back to her country. And in the media, you can see that she's quoted that she can say this was a mistake. Uh, we're looking at our protocols and we're gonna fix this. Uh, she didn't uh, take away this idea of ego of letting it drive her and say, well, I eradicated uh, coronavirus, I don't see why this has happened, and blaming others. Uh, it's, so it's a different way of leadership, and women tend to take out ego and look at solutions. And that really, that's what helps a country. Uh, and leaders, uh, maybe with a, a different way of looking at ego. Now, all of us have the ego, we all have it. We can't get away from having it, it is true. Uh, and there are women leaders who have ego and uh, maybe don't use it in the best way possible. Uh, however, I do find, especially through interviewing and doing research, that women inherently are looking for solutions that are gonna benefit the team. Uh, when you think about a woman's role in society, uh, many women are central to their family unit and they're trying to negotiate even with their own family and be the center of a household. And they take these skills and that mentality to the workforce and into diplomacy for finding solutions and having to negotiate and that it not be about them, but it be about the solution at hand. Thank you, Susan. When it comes to getting a seat at the table and you mentioned in your book, you know, there are structural and systemic change needs to happen. Institutions have to change and particularly the ambassadors and people that you interviewed from the Nordic countries have started figuring this out more and going back to the example that you gave of Namibia. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, because this is applicable to what is going on here. We're talking about, you know, parental leave, childcare, paid childcare, etc. Can you give us a little insight on, you know, um, gained about using targets instead of quotas in building interdisciplinarity? Well, I want to tell you three things. Um, the first thing is that what helps women get in leadership is one, adequate parental leave for both men and women. So when people have children, that they're both going to be out of the workforce, not just women. Um, so if someone's up for a, a promotion or a managerial role, they're, men and women are both seen equally because at some point they'll both be out of the workforce because they're both taking parental leave. So adequate parental leave and not just a few weeks, we're talking about nine months to a year of parental leave. Maybe that's split between the two parents. Uh, that's one. Number two, adequate child care significantly helps women be at the table. Uh, and we've heard this from many women prime ministers that they wouldn't be in the positions of power had it not been for adequate childcare, and usually it's government-sponsored childcare. And that's something the United States really can work on as well, is looking at our childcare issues, that it's one, very, very expensive, uh, and two, people can't afford it, and three, we don't have a great system to raise our own children. And going to your point about targets versus quotas, this is a huge debate that's going on with many countries into having women in managerial roles and leadership. In particular, one story comes to mind. Uh, when I sat down with Ambassador Katrina Cooper uh, from Australia, she has an ambassador title. She's currently serving as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Washington, DC. She was ambassador to Mexico. She was pivotal in helping her country and her ministry reach an area of gender equality and gender parity. Uh, when she started out in the Foreign Service, she was in a diplomatic class of a generally equal of men and women. And what she found though, as she rose in the ranks of leadership and she was then appointed to be senior legal advisor, so the C-suite of the ministry, uh, she found that she was one of very few women sitting around the table. More than that, she started looking at the managerial roles and she realized that women weren't in these managerial roles either. So she started asking questions and she brought this up to the secretary of the ministry and to her colleagues and she kept bringing it up. And one of her colleagues told her, you have to get leadership on board. You have to get the secretary on board. It has to come from the top. And so that's what she did. She, when she asked the secretary to look at these initiatives and these areas that they need to improve on, he said, oh, okay, well, why don't you lead that? And she pushed back and said, no, it really needs to come from you. 
And so what they did is they hired an outside consultant and the consultant came in and, and looked at the areas of the ministry that they could improve. And what they found is that they needed to have a split of 40% men, 40% women, and 20% either in leadership and in managerial roles. And that split would create the culture change that the ministry needed to have more women at the table. And so this idea of whether to have targets or quotas came to be from this percentages. So what they decided to do, rather than having a quota saying, okay, we need to get 40% women in leadership and managerial roles, um, and this is what we're going to do, they decided to do targets instead. Now targets are aspirational. So if you don't reach them, it's not the end of the world, but also that you want to get qualified people with merit coming through your doors. And let's say you don't get enough qualified people to apply to a position or to be in these roles, you don't want somebody who's unqualified in the position. And you also don't want colleagues who maybe are male who are qualified not to have the position either. So they created this idea of targets and they built out a system of saying, okay, by X year, we're going to have 30% women in these roles. And then by five years later, we're going to have 35%. And then five years later, we're going to have 40%. And the first few years, they actually didn't hit their targets, but they had somewhere to shoot for. And eventually, they did get to the 40% of women in leadership and managerial roles actually a year ahead of when they were projected to be there. And so, yes, it may be a slow process to use targets. And many people are debating this right now saying, well, quotas at least get people in the door. You also want to have the time to have qualified and merit-based candidates. And so what we're seeing in diplomacy and also in the private sector is that targets can be beneficial to an organization and the leadership if they're used correctly. Thank you, Susan. And, you know, staying with, you know, women, um, someone asks, you know, I've always had an, I am a large proponent of emboldening women's participation in diplomacy to maximize our efficacy. But one question I've always had is how do non-binary or gender non-conforming individuals fit into, you know, foreign policy? Um, do you have any data of how this would apply to the participation of individuals, considering that you mentioned in the beginning, you know, statistics on profitability in both, you know, the private sector, et cetera? Good question. Uh, it's actually something that when I was working on the book, I was discussing with my publisher, as well as my editors and women that I interviewed, uh, this idea of gender and what is gender right now. We have a fluidity of gender, I would say. Uh, we have people that uh, say they're men, we have people that say they're women, we have people say that they're gender neutral or binary, it doesn't matter what they are, right? And so this idea of being inclusive has a far greater meaning now than ever before. Um, people can identify as however they choose. At the same time, we do have to look at gender being sometimes men and women for numbers sake. And so where does somebody who doesn't say they're a man or woman fit into that? Uh, and if you look at the targets, you could say, okay, if we're talking about 40% men, 40% women, 20% either, that 20% either, people can fit in there, right? There's this idea of that. But more than that, people can identify as any way they choose. So if people are choosing to identify as a man or woman, then that is their seat at the table. This idea of diversity, though, is not just about gender. It's far more than that. When we look around the table, and who is there, what we need to be looking at, in addition to gender, is socioeconomic status, faith, sexual orientation, race, national origin, all of it. That is true diversity. Uh, and so gender is just one lens of that. And having binary, non-binary is another lens of that. And so diversity really encompasses all of those things. Uh, and when I was writing the book, there was uh, one instance where I went back and forth with my editor about an idea about including what actually it was about a, a, with a Ambassador Nishandi from Namibia when she told me about the zebra policy. I, I said, oh, why don't we have a, a policy in the United States of the stars and stripes and, and red, white, and blue, and maybe it's 
um, male, female, you know, non-conforming, whatever. And uh, my editor was like, hey, you need to pare this down a little bit. You, <laughs> we need to edit this in a way that will make sense for the readers. Uh, but it's something that I was thinking about while writing the book, especially because I mentioned men and women and those words quite frequently throughout the narrative. Uh, and it's something that I've been thinking about, but I do believe that gender is completely fluid depending upon who the person is and how they see themselves. And given whoever they decide to be and whoever they decide to identify, they need a seat at the table just as much as anyone else, because without that diversity, we're not gonna look at the completeness of society. and We're not gonna build better solutions. So everyone needs to be there. Thank you, Susan. Two more questions. We want to be mindful of time. So we have quite a few participants that are thinking about, you know, diplomacy as a career path. Uh, what advice, insights would you have for them? Well, first, get the book because the advice and the mentorship is there. Uh, definitely. Uh, the women I spoke to who said they, when they wanted to start a career in diplomacy, and there's many ways to think about diplomacy. You could think, oh, I want to be a foreign service officer. I want to work in the diplomatic corps. You can think about diplomacy by working for an NGO, a non-government organization, uh, or a nonprofit. There's many ways to impact diplomacy. And so you have to decide which sector that you wish to go into. Uh, one thing I will say that if you're interested in this field, uh, there are many different think tanks in Washington, D.C. that you can watch webinars and get involved in and hear about policy and diplomacy. And especially if you're interested in international affairs, being a part of Global Minnesota and being a part of the programs to know what's going on in the world. Uh, what I found, though, through my interviews is that the women who got involved in diplomacy have always been fascinated by the world and, and have read a lot. They've also believed in getting an education has helped them in their career. And so being educated, whether you get an undergraduate degree and also a master's degree, many of these women I interview that are ambassadors, um, they are very well decorated in the educational field and have speak many languages and have many degrees. Uh, I believe that if you are interested in this field and in diplomacy, you also might consider getting an internship at the State Department or a foreign ministry that if you live in a different country, that's one way to get involved. And number two, if you start following international leaders and maybe reach out to them on LinkedIn to hear their stories and hear how they got involved, I find that learning from others and hearing other stories creates this treasure trove of information and knowledge that you can use for yourself. The first step though, is getting an education, 100%. Thank you, Susan. Last question. Will there be a part two to your book? Are there any women that you would have loved to keep on interviewing? What is next for you? Well, yeah, actually, there, there are many women I would have loved to keep interviewing. And if you would like to add to this list, and I'm actually going to share my screen right now. Uh, I want to show you guys um, how to get in contact with me. And uh, that way we can keep up and keep this conversation going. Uh, I have a few ideas on the horizons of books I wish to write, and I'm hoping that that happens. Uh, a friend of mine reached out to me with a woman from the Middle East who is a journalist, and uh, she's interested in telling her story, and that may be something uh, I might consider writing and doing. Uh, in dealing with diplomacy, though, uh, uh, one of the ambassadors asked me in our conversation, have you considered writing a book about women, but only interviewing men? So that's also something, um, <laughs> uh, a few of the people that described it to me, but our world is changing so much right now that there are many topics I'm interested in. And what I found though, is that I love to share stories of individuals who don't get heard enough and also that will benefit others in society. And so I hope the next book or the next thing that I write, and I have been writing Medium articles, so please check that out. I've been writing on Medium. Uh, but I really wanna tell the stories that will impact society. And I believe that stories and narratives will really create systemic change if we have the knowledge base. The sooner, the better. We need more genders at the table. We need more women at the table. We need to have equality, parity, and equity. And if we all learn from each other, we're gonna be in a better place. But so the first things first, uh, I hope you all get the book. 
and uh, check it out. And uh, please get in touch with me and I, I'd love to hear more about what you think of it. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And Monica, thank you for keeping us moving ahead. Um, for some of you, uh, you can go to our Global Minnesota website and uh, Ambassador Barcena from Mexico was here and we had her for almost a week and you can find presentations by many of these women ambassadors that were talked about or who are finding new places and foreign ministries and in other parts of the world. But as we heard from Katie, and thank you again for uh, your support and being partner, you can see that there are many aspects to this global uh, we now have a global pandemic. We're learning a lot of new things, but there are many opportunities to make a difference. Maybe it's a professional difference, and maybe it's a volunteer, maybe it's a travel or a hosting. And so Global Minnesota's 70 years of connecting Minnesotans to the world and the world to Minnesota is part of what we do to make sure that Minnesota remains a very welcoming place for the planet, it remains a place that's global-minded about how what we do affects each other. Thank you so much, and good night, good morning, good afternoon, good rest of your day. Bye now.